Thank you very much. Um, it's a wonderful to be here today um, at Comsum. Uh, thanks to the organizers, everyone who's put this on. Um, and it's delightful to do a talk at a conference in my hometown of Manchester. And so for anyone who's visiting Manchester, uh, you're very welcome here. I hope you decide to stay. Um, and today we're talking about Quantum Ledger. I called this talk Quantumania. Um, may have brought up the Ant-Man film because I thought that something good had to come out of that film. Um, and the talk today is about a database system. And it's about using a new database system, one that maybe you've not heard of before. Um, and when we think about using a new database, often we have this sort of feeling. We don't want to use a new database. We hear about serverless tools. We hear about new development tools, new monitoring tools. All these things we hear about when we come to conferences, we think, oh yeah, I want to try that. I want to use that. But databases, no, 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 no. Our data has been sat in this SQL server that's running in a rack somewhere. We, we don't even really know which rack it's in anymore. But the data's there, and it's been working for about five years without a reboot. And we're just going to leave it there. We don't want to touch it. The data in our businesses is precious to us. We're very wary of trying something new with data. So I'm aware that to talk about a new database service, to suggest you should move away from what you've been using, I need to present you with a reason, a motivation to move. And so I'm going to highlight that we have a problem. We've talked about how precious that data is, but we have a question, which is, who can we trust? More than ever, our data and everything around it is under threat. It's under threat from external actors, people who are going to hack into our systems, maybe targeted, maybe just trying to find someone to compromise and get some money out of. It's under threat from supply chain compromise. Someone hacks a popular GitHub library or, I don't know, something called Log4j or something and finds a vulnerability that gets into our systems that way. And finally, there are internal bad actors, people within our businesses who see that they can modify something, change part of our uh, data to benefit themselves. Maybe it's a disgruntled ex-employee who we forgot to revoke access to. Either way, we have this kind of a typical hacker view, someone who's a threat to our systems. If they can get into our systems, modify our data, change it without us noticing, our business could be severely compromised. Now, there are some solutions to this. You're probably already thinking of some of these things in your traditional database world. We have event auditing. You can audit actions or changes of data. So you can say, this change on this date at this time. Similarly, you could have access controls. So we can log the time and duration of access. Who has access when? Did someone acquire access to our database at 2 AM? That's a bit weird, isn't it? And we can segregate our data backups, put the backups somewhere else, off-site, um, on a tape. We recently moved into a new office in Manchester who clearly hadn't updated their terms and conditions for about 20 years. And part of the terms and conditions said we were responsible for maintaining our own tape backups. Um, so maybe you could do that with your data. And of course, whenever you talk these days about data integrity and security, someone will always mention something, something blockchain. And will any of these tools thwart our cliched hacker type? I don't really think so. If we're auditing events, the storage of the audit data is often as vulnerable, and let's be honest, it's often in the same place as our actual data is stored. With access controls, we can set these up incorrectly. Setting up correct IAM policies or usage controls is difficult. Maybe we get an alert that someone acquired a role to access our database, but we get it at 9 a.m. the next morning when we arrive at work, and it was 2 a.m. last night, and you're already compromised. And our segregated data backups become more targets, a separate target for our attackers. If you have segregated data backups, when was the last time you verified the data in that backup was the data you expect if you need to do a rest restoration? And so maybe at this point you're thinking, could we have our data store protect its own integrity? And so we're going to talk, no, no, wait, 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 no. So you mentioned blockchain before. I've heard about blockchain. I want you to talk more about blockchain. OK. The reason people think about blockchain in the area of data security and integrity is that it has a feature of, called immutability. We think about immutability because that seems like a really good thing for our data. It shouldn't be able to change. We can't change the past. We can't change history. And so immutability is a great feature for a data store that we can rely on. And yeah, blockchains are immutable. Uh, if you look at something like Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, these large blockchains, they are immutable. You can't just go onto your computer, no matter how clever a hacker you are, and just change all the Bitcoin transactions in everyone's wallet. But there are other problems that we have to consider if we wish to use blockchains as a storage or a part of our data storage infrastructure. 
Public blockchains have transaction costs. This is something that uh, wouldn't have been thought about in the early days of blockchains, but is really relevant now. If you want to write any sort of data to a public blockchain, say Ethereum, you will pay a gas fee or a transaction fee in the case of Bitcoin, and those can be really high. If you're writing a lot of data, you could spend a lot of money purely on writing to a blockchain. Public blockchains leak information. There are companies like Chainalysis who track wallet addresses on Ethereum, on Bitcoin, and try and work out whose data this is, whose money is this, whose transactions in these, whose smart contracts are these. And even if you're not revealing data, maybe you're just writing hashes or some sort of logging that's unintelligible to these records, people could still figure out this is you, this is your business, this is what you're doing. Oh, they've done a lot of transactions today. Uh, okay, maybe public blockchain isn't the way, a private blockchain. We'll set up a blockchain, I've heard this said by companies, we'll set up a blockchain with just us and our partners. Maybe we're in the insurance industry. So us and the other insurers, the underwriters, the brokers, we'll have a private blockchain set up that's just between us, and then them will have this non uh, immut we'll have this immutable data store. But the problem is now you're just bringing in a new attack vector. How many of your people setting up your infrastructure know how to maintain the security and the accuracy of blockchain systems? You're asking them to bring in a new unproven technology. And once again, you have a new um, attack vector and a new vulnerability. And of course, we can't mention blockchains without thinking about what an absolute tire fire they are for the environment and for the world of scams and other things that go on within them. So we are going to come back to blockchains a little bit later with a few useful things they do provide us. But for now, we want to talk about ledgers. What do we mean by a ledger? A ledger is an old system of record keeping. Um, it predates all the digital systems we use today. And a ledger has some really interesting features. It's a mechanism primarily for integrity. It's used uh, in finance, and it makes tampering obvious. The ledger both stores your data and verifies your data. It makes sure the data hasn't been modified or changed. And it relies on history. A single record in a ledger by itself does not tell you whether that record should have been there or not. But with the history of lots of transactions in a ledger, they become much harder to do anything malicious with. And here's an example of what a ledger would look like in a modern accounting system. This is a screenshot from Xero, um, and um, many other accounting systems will use this, but I chose Xero because I'm more familiar with it. In a ledger, uh, we will have to always make transactions balance. If we are debiting money from one account, we must credit it to another account. Money can't just spring out of nowhere. It has to be recorded. In this case, we can see an error is up on the screen. I don't know how well you can see it at the back, but there's an error at the top of the screen. And the reason there's an error is because the transactions in the journal ledger you're trying to add do not match. So they don't match, and so they fail the accounting equation, so the person can't add this transaction. It's a check against mistakes as well as maliciousness. Once this record is added to the journal, all the different accounts that this journal affects will, once again, balance. The ledger stores actual accounting data in this case. It checks against mistakes. If you want to uh, add some new data, it will tell you that you've got that wrong, um, either just by looking at the math, if you're writing it on hand, if you're writing it on paper, it wouldn't pop up a little error message unless you've got some very cool paper. Um, but it would still, at the end of the day, you could look at the totals and go, they don't match, so there's something wrong. And it's probably a mistake at that point. Well, they also protect against abuse. If you want to go back to last month and you're the company's accountant and you want to say, I was underpaid last month, and you just change that amount you were paid to a lower number, and then you say, oh, look, I was only paid this much. You need to pay me more of my wages. Well, at this point, the accounting uh, algorithms wouldn't match for the rest of the ledger. All of the accounts would suddenly be out of balance if you traced it from this transaction that you'd altered to the current state. You would see there'd been abuse in the system. And that's where ledgers are a valuable thing in integrity of data. And how can we apply this to a database? We're not just talking about accounting here, although finance is a great use for integrity-based databases. This can apply uh, as part of database transactions. In a ledger database, not just the state of the data, which is what we usually think when we talk about databases, but the transactions that make that state happen, the inserts, the updates, the deletes, form part of your audit chain. And instead of verification by two numbers matching, we use cryptographic verification, which is actually kind of similar. We use um, hashes. Two hash operations must match to say that our data hasn't been altered or tampered with since it was written. And in the same way as an accounting ledger, it relies on history. A single record written to the ledger isn't, going to, isn't verified by the ledger. 
you could write anything you want to the ledger. That's your application, your business logic that's choosing that. But once you have some records in your ledger, someone can't just go back and arbitrarily modify some data. Oh, look, my account balance is a million pounds. That's wonderful, isn't it? No one noticed. I'm a millionaire now. And I'll just withdraw that money, please, and I'll be off. Thank you. You can't do that anymore. We're going to now explore a bit more about quantum ledger and how it works. But there's a few sort of glossary terms I want to talk about first. Um, particle. This is a query language for quantum ledger. Um, you'll notice a QL at the end there. It's a SQL-like language. It has a few extra bits of syntax, and it also has a few things it can't do. So it can't do order by or group by at the moment. Um, Amazon Ion, it's a uh, superset of JSON, because why keep to something simple? Um, and this represents information in the ledger. It's essentially JSON, but with some native types for dates, um, binary representations, and for some reason you use single quotes instead of double quotes. And then there's a digest. This is a term that will come up quite a few times in this talk. A digest is a hash that verifies the current state of your ledger at a given point in time. And I've mentioned the word hash a few times. If you're not familiar with hashes, they're one-way algorithms. You can take some data and put it into a hash, and then you'll get a short string out of that hash. Um, they are deterministic. Running the same hash operation on the same data will always produce the same output. Um, and they uh, verify tiny changes. If you change, like, a, if you have a massive load of text, you change one character in it, the hash will probably look completely different. They're really useful for just human verification. Uh, if, you, if I give you a paragraph of text and say, has this changed, it's like spot the difference. But if you hash both of them, you'll see the change instantly. Um, and they are collision resistant. I can't take a hash and tell you what data made that hash. So you can't reverse them, and you can't make fake data that matches a certain hash. Or if the hash algorithm is strong, you can't do it. And so a ledger uses all these things. We see hash chaining, and we can see this diagram here. This is an official AWS diagram, um, so if you can't see it on the slides, depending on where you're sat, um, you can go up on the Quantum Ledger documentation, which has this diagram as well. The database is made of blocks, um, and these blocks are structured sort of one after the other. One might say they're in some form of chain. Um, and the blocks contain particle queries, the transactions, inserts, updates, deletes that make up that block. They contain the revisions of your documents that happened in that block. Metadata, when did this happen, uh, IDs. And they contain a hash of that block to say this hash verifies everything that happened in this block. They're linked together. And at every point where there's a link between two blocks, a digest is created. And inside the blocks, we see something similar. We've got um, strands of blocks. You can see that our documents have revisions. So each time we edit a document, or even if we delete it, it actually just creates a new revision the same document, which is very helpful, and we're going to explore that more in a bit. And there's a sequence number. This just counts up with all the different transactions you run on your ledger. Um, and it's worth noting, if you're looking at sequence numbers and you're trying to sort of figure out what someone's doing in your database, the sequence number will still change even for queries like selects. Um, so if you're like running a load of selects on your database, and then you look at the sequence number, and it's much higher than when you started, don't worry. No one's tampering with your data. You've just been using it. And at the very least at this stage, when our hacker comes along to try and break into this database, it will confuse the hell out of them. But where's the actual database and all this? You've talked about maths and hashes and, and verification and evil hooded figures. Where, where's an actual database that we can use? A few basics about quantum ledger. It's serverless. You don't have to consider how much CPU to allocate, how much RAM to allocate, how much storage to allocate, which is a wonderful thing for people who are sort of application development minded. All that stuff sort of goes away. It's a document store. It's similar to something like MongoDB or certain views around things like DynamoDB. You can post JSON documents into it, and they can have nested structures and all the kind of things you're used to from document stores. You don't need to just find a schema. It's ACID compliant. So if you want to write transactions, checking a value exists, then updating it, and then checking again, and make sure that two people can't do that at the same time and accidentally add the same payment to someone's uh, record, um, it has ACID compliant transactions that will fail and roll back if something goes wrong. And as I mentioned, it's got this particle, a SQL-like interface. If your team already knows SQL, it's not a huge jump to learn the few tweaks to uh, make them write particle. It uses drivers, not APIs. This is a key difference for people who are familiar with DynamoDB. With Dynamo, you can talk to Dynamo via HTTP APIs, AWS CLI, all the SDKs, um, which is really convenient. Uh, with Quantum Ledger, it's still a bit more like a traditional database that needs a driver and a session to actually carry out queries. And that means that you must run a driver within your code in order to talk to Quantum Ledger. Um, there are drivers available for a lot of languages, Java, JavaScript, uh, Python, 
I think there's maybe others, um, but they aren't available for every language. So that is a slight restriction versus something like Dynamo with a full HTTP API. And creating a table is really easy because there's no schema. You just create a table. And inserting data is also fairly easy. Here's our JSON-like ion document. Um, again, you'll notice a few features there. We've got the single quotes instead of double quotes. Um, we've got nested data, so our address is an object rather than um, just a single field. And we've also got a list of strings there. When we're inserting, we can also uh, add multiple items in one insert. We can create indexes on quantum ledger tables. Again, similar to the world of SQL databases where you can arbitrarily say, I want to create an index. There are a few things it's worth being aware of with indexes in quantum ledger. Um, they are basically essential if you intend to ever read your data. Uh, you will want indexes on your database. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that towards the end. Um, you're limited to five indexes per table. Uh, unlike something like DynamoDB local indexes, you don't have to define your indexes up front. You can define them at any time. And they're not required to be unique. So just because you define an index on um, something like user ID, you don't have to have a user ID on every record. And multiple records, if they want, can share the same user ID. You're just indexing that particular field. There's no composite indexes, so like with SQL where you can index how two fields relate to each other, you can't do that in uh, QLDB, but similar to how you might do it in Dynamo, you can just write a composite field into your document to start with. And they're only for top level items. So in my insert here, I couldn't index the city here because it's not a top level item. I couldn't find all people with Manchester. And there's identity and access management to consider as well. This is a really good feature of Quantum Ledger, that all of the access management is handled in AWS's IAM system via policies and roles. And it's quite granular. You can define a specific role or a specific user via a policy, can call a select, but not an insert, or an update, but not a delete. This person can create indexes, but not tables. Um, and so you can be very, very granular with your permissions via IAM roles. Um, and that's really useful. Uh, even if you've used, say, uh, the IAM role uh, integration in RDS, you still have to configure your permissions in RDS, but then your role is in IAM and it's a little bit confusing. Um, so Quantum Ledger kind of fixes that by allowing query level um, ident access control. I've mentioned revisions, and I think this is one of the strongest features of Quantum Ledger. Um, obviously, all the sort of math cryptographically verifying stuff is really cool. But really, the biggest thing we often want to look at in our data might not even be from malicious activity. It might just be because the system went wrong. It did the wrong thing. Someone went in and made a change they shouldn't have made. And so having history of all our documents, I've talked about having this list of all the transactions. If you know all the transactions that made up your data, you can therefore infer what your data was at any point in time. Um, and this is the point where we're going to do a live demo, because I think if you're going to look at the history features of a system, it's more interesting to see it than to see me put a lot of queries and data items on screen. Um, as always, live demos can go completely wrong uh, at any time, and it's governed by some sort of weird quantum algorithm. Um, but hopefully, it will not do that. So firstly, let's check you can see everything that I've got on my screen. I'm going to go into presentation mode here in PHP Storm, and we can see that just about. And we can also see, if I can get to the right page, the Quantum Ledger console. Um, Quantum Ledger has a really good console. Uh, it's uh, a, a, a great tool, especially when you're learning how to use Quantum Ledger. Um, because of the way we can't interact with Quantum Ledger via APIs, the console is where you'll conduct a lot of your initial learning, um, rather than having to like write code, deploy it, run it via a driver. That can be a little bit difficult. Um, so the console is really useful. The console will also help you avoid some of the pitfalls I'll mention a bit later. So there's some uh, spoilers ahead. So in order to talk about history, we need some data. I've already made our table. I've actually already added the index. And you will notice that on my slides, I didn't mention this at the start, probably should have done, um, there's a GitHub link. It's on the top, of, uh, top right corner of all the slides. Um, that's not essential for you to have noted and downloaded to look at this talk. But I would recommend you download that repo at some point, uh, maybe at the end of the talk, and I'll put it on my LinkedIn as well afterwards, because that repo contains this readme um, and all the stuff I've said, um, and it also contains a serverless application which will give you your own endpoint to send data into Quantum Ledger, um, your own stream to stream data out of Quantum Ledger, and a way to verify your data. So um, if you want sort of a, a sort of Kickstarter for Quantum Ledger, all for free, uh, please go and rob it off my GitHub. So we're going to insert some data into our query. And we're going to insert that same data we saw just before in the slides. I'm going to hit Run and hope that it works. And we can see that it's inserted my document. It gives us some interesting information. Uh, the query took 0.322 seconds. Great to know. Um, we got some latency of 
that many seconds. Don't know why it says that, but there we go. Um, and we get a document ID. This document ID is a unique ID generated by Quantum Ledger whenever we insert data. Um, the, the Quantum Ledger documentation is at pains in multiple bullet points to inform you not to infer anything from this document ID other than that it's an ID. It does not represent time. You should not sort by it. Um, but it is useful to know. And because we're going to do some history transactions, I'm just going to quickly store this so we can come back to it later. And the next thing we're going to do is select this data with something extra. If you don't log that document ID when you initially insert a record, and you might not always, you can get that ID at any time with one slight change to SQL syntax. You can see we have this by ID. So this is a new bit of syntax that's not familiar in regular SQL. Um, and what this will do is get you your data and also get you Quantum Ledger's unique ID for that row. So if we open it up here, and you'll see we have the ID there at the bottom. And the term ID here is just what do you want Quantum Ledger's ID to be called? So um, we could call this chicken, um, and it would still work, and we'd get a field with the ID in it that's called chicken. Um, so that's just that the ID isn't a special keyword. Um, obviously, you might not use chicken in your code because other people will be confused. Um, but you could call it underscore Quantum Ledger unique ID or something else that makes more sense. Now we know we have an ID and we've got some data, I'm going to do a quick uh, thing where I will run this serverless invoke function. I'm not going to fully explain what I'm doing just now, but I will come back to this a bit later. Suffice to say, it's important I do this at this stage so we can demonstrate some of the cryptographic verification later on in the talk. And now we go back, and we're going to update some data. We're going to finally make some history by updating data. We're going to first change our location for some reason to Liverpool. And we just get the document ID back again. So each time we run an update, we get the document ID back. So we're now in Liverpool. Um, sorry. Um, and we're now going to look at another little extra bit of Quantum Ledger syntax. Um, so in this case, we have, because Quantum Ledger uses nested data, um, we can do this interesting syntax where we say from the table, insert into. So we can actually add new uh, rows into existing data. This is really useful versus, say, something like with Dynamo, where with Dynamo, if I want to write a new field into my object, I have to get the object first, add the field, and then write the object back. Um, with Quantum Ledger, I don't have to know anything about an object to say, just insert this new item into the existing object. I don't need to know other than its ID. Um, I don't need to know anything about that object, which is really useful. And again, I can do this over user ID one. doesn't have to be one row. It could be 100 rows. Um, so that's quite useful syntax if you're doing lots of updates. So I'm going to add a new hobby of SQL because, you know, everyone has something wrong with them. Um, and then finally, after all this work creating data, we're just going to delete it because YOLO. Um, let's delete that data. We still get the document ID back at this stage, uh, even when we've deleted it. And now it's time to look at some history. We've just done a load of work. We want to see what our work has accomplished. So I'm going to copy this query. Um, and again, this is a bit more complex for you to look at, but it's all in the readme file in the repository if you download it. Um, so uh, I have timed my talk very well because that timestamp is correct uh, for what we're doing. I'm going to grab our document ID. Now, a few of you, when I said that timestamp is correct, immediately thought I was wrong. Um, that timestamp is in UTC. Uh, so at the moment, despite the fact that it is getting colder outside, we are still in daylight savings time. Um, so it, you will definitely trip over if you try and do timestamps in uh, British summertime uh, with the quantum ledger, because it will tell you that's in, the pa that's in the future. Please don't query that time. But in this case, we should be just about right. Uh, 11.40 to 11.45 um, on this date. So we're going to run this. And hopefully it won't error and we see the history of our document. And again, I've mentioned the Quantum Ledger console is really useful. It's got these different views, and this is a good part to look at the table view. So we can see a bit of information about the history of this document. We've got four revisions. If you remember, we did an insert, we did a, an update, we did a different kind of update, and we did a delete. So there's our four revisions. We can see that the metadata added gives us a version number. We got a version number zero for when we inserted it, and then version numbers for each update and for the delete. We get some metadata about the time each of those happened at. And we get the actual data itself. So if you remember in our first insert, we were in Manchester. The second thing we did was update that to Liverpool. The third thing we did was add a new hobby, which has actually appeared over here because it was added later than everything else. 
And the final thing we did was delete it. And you'll notice this last row doesn't have any data records. So we could do an interesting thing where instead of querying the, the uh, metadata ID, we queried the data user ID. And the data user ID would return the three records that we had uh, data in, but it wouldn't tell us it was deleted. So that's a, a little interesting point that if you query by data in your history, which is a good way to query things, you should also check the metadata ID afterwards to see if there are more rows for the metadata query than the data query, one of those rows is probably a delete. Um, it would also, again, you could change the data user ID. Th these, aren't, these are indexes, but they, they're not resistant to change. So there's no rules around that. And for each of these items, we also have a hash. So that tells us the hash at the time that record was generated. And this sequence number, and we'll see they count up. And at this point, I'm going to also move to the ION view. So this is the ION view. So this is kind of Amazon's internal representation of this data. And for certain quantum ledger features, you need to know the format in ION rather than in JSON or in CSV or anything else. I'm just going to copy this because, again, we're going to do some verification in a moment. And this will be quite useful for that uh, verification process. Oops. Um, so just going to copy that there. And we're now going to switch back for a little bit back to our slides. So uh, seemed, seemed like it worked. Um, so that's, that's good, isn't it? We can all breathe a little bit uh, of relief. But don't, don't, don't fear. We've got more chance of stuff to go wrong. We're going to do another live demo in a few minutes. And you will see up the top corner there, there's that GitHub link if you want to grab that repository. Um, I'll leave it public probably for today and tomorrow, and then it'll go private again so I can shill it at another conference. Um, digests. We've talked about digests and how uh, you need to verify the integrity. I kind of began with that premise. It would seem a shame if I didn't talk about it in more detail. Um, in fact, you'll remember at the start of this talk, we decided that a ledger relies on history. It relies on history. If you don't know what's happened in the past in your ledger, you can't verify if that was correct or not. The time to get hold of a digest for your ledger, therefore, is not when you think you've been hacked. By the time you think you've been hacked, it's too late. Because obviously, if someone is malicious and clever and sneaky and hoody enough to have hacked you, they may have changed your ledger or the cryptographic verification or all those things. But what someone who's hacking your database can't do is hack every single thing you possibly own. Um, di don't, don't challenge me on that. Digest must be fetched ahead of time. And you should automate them to a visible source. Um, in our business, we automate these to Slack. Uh, because it's a great place to just put data that you might need at some point in the future and you don't know about it. Um, and someone could modify one digest or delete one digest or something, but if you are posting your digest every day to Slack, someone has to go to quite a lot of work to clear out all those digests. You could also send it to other sources, stick it in S3, text it to your mum's friend, um, write it on a wall, um, print it out and stick it around the office. Digest could be put in lots of different places. There's no um, data risk from a digest. It's just a number and a hash. Um, so fetch those digests, spread them around wildly, um, put them on your Twitter, email them to people. Um, it's probably the better content you'll see on Twitter these days anyway. Um, so digests must be fetched ahead of time. And this is where we come back to something about Bitcoin uh, or blockchains in general. Um, yeah, there is something that blockchains can provide for our actual use case here. Um, and it's called a Merkle tree. You may be thinking about the concept of uh, hashing this data. Hashing is a relatively fast operation in most um, modern systems. But if you have a thousand rows of data, or a million rows of data, or insert big number here rows of data, calculating that many hashes to verify a transaction that was modified maybe or suspected to be modified three years ago might be quite computationally intensive. And you might find, oh, is there a logical limit to how big a quantum ledger database can get? And maybe that's a problem for us. Do we have to like move to a new database every few months to sort of maintain the sort of chain uh, accuracy and the ability to verify? Merkle trees help to solve that problem. They don't eradicate it. They help to solve that problem. Um, using a Merkle tree, and this is the same way, again, blockchains will work. Um, and they're also involved in, in Git. Um, using a Merkle tree, Rather than simply hashing each block in turn, and so if I want to verify block over here, I have to go back and hash each one all the way, a Merkle tree uses proof hashes that are intermediate hashes between sets of blocks, and this kind of works up in a tree form. This means that um, if anyone's familiar with the big O notation in computer science, um, the hashing a sort of set of blocks would be O-N, so the longer my chain gets, just the verification increases linearly by the same amount. By using a Merkle tree, we can turn that into log n. 
So if I want my, uh, if my chain gets 10 times as long, it only takes twice as long to verify. And this is very helpful if you want to rely on being able to verify data a long way back. And it is a useful thing. It, blockchains didn't invent Merkle trees, but they have really popularized them. And so it's one of the things that AWS uses as a bit of a selling point for like, get onto Quantum Ledger, it's sort of blockchain-y a bit like. Um, so Merkle trees, um, you don't have to understand the maths, but if you want to actually write your own verifier for Quantum Ledger, you will probably have to understand some of the maths. Oh no, it's another live demo. Um, so we're now gonna show you verification um, in Quantum Ledger. And helpfully, we saved some data before um, that will allow us to do this. So switch to our Quantum Ledger console, and Quantum Ledger has a verification tool built into the console, which is really useful for doing what we're doing. We choose our ledger, um, or Comsum, and we're gonna verify this document that we've been playing with for this talk. We're gonna put that in here, and we're gonna get the block address that we saved from our original insert. So what we're gonna check here is, has that original insert been modified? We know the document was updated a few times. We know it was deleted, and we're okay with that. But that original insert may have had some data, and we're wondering, was, can we trust that insert? Was it the right person? Were they really at Comsum? Did they live in Manchester? And we're gonna check that data. We give it the block address, which we found from our history query, and then we're gonna get the digest, which we saved just after the insert. The just after is important. And the digest also has this block address. And try as I might in making my little serverless digest function, I couldn't get it to remove these slashes. Um, so, I'll put that in there. Don't panic, they've finished early. Um, you will not miss out on lunch. And there we go, we can click verify, and we get a verification. And I'm sure you can all see that those hashes are the correct hashes. Um, no? You're not, not all done the maths already? No? Jeez. Um, the hashes here are those proof hashes. So they're these kind of intermediary hashes of your blocks. And again, in AWS's documentation for Quantum Ledger, they are very firm on the fact that you can do all this yourself. You know, really, if you want to trust this via cryptography, you shouldn't just trust a system that's telling you it's gonna match, because it could just tell you that. Um, though they actually provide samples, I think it's in Java, um, that you can write a verification algorithm yourself which will do these hashes. And so you could write that and you could do a few tests versus the console and say, oh look, you know, when I run by the console, it gives these hashes, and when I run by my Java program, it gives these same hashes. Um, and so we can sort of trust that application, trust that system. This starts from our block here, I just went loud for a second there. This starts from our block here um, at hash, uh, sequence 770, which is where we inserted it and it calculates all the hashes up to sequence 777, uh, which is when I got the digest. You will notice that that number is seven apart from the fact that I literally calculate the digest straight after. Um, don't at me on that, I don't know why that is. Uh, but it is worth noting that if we change this to a lower number, Quantum Ledger would refuse to do our verification because our sequence is behind the item we're verifying. So we can't use a digest calculated before something happened to verify the thing afterwards. Now that might be sort of obvious, but it's worth thinking about if you're looking at actually verifying transactions. Um, if someone is going to sort of hack you and you don't have a digest uh, you know, after that, then you might, still, you might still miss something. So that's why again, regular digest is important. Um, so there we go, if we do that, I'm just gonna switch it back to 7.7. Seven. Oh no, now I've broken it, 7.7. Seven, seven. And there we go. Uh, and we also get some information on the block, so we can see the actual original insert statement that was run, um, and some metadata, when did that happen, what, what, how did that work? And that, in a nutshell, is Quantum Ledger verification. What to watch out for? Um, we're running Quantum Ledger in production, and hopefully that's useful for me to give a talk on it. Um, I know that a lot of talks can be like somewhat hypothetical, um, and sort of workshoppy, and sort of give you these ideas of, oh, you could go and build this. We've been running Quantum Ledger production for two years, so we've learned some of the pitfalls of it. Um, and the pitfalls all kind of rotate around one thing. Um, Lookups without indexes perform table scans. If you've used DynamoDB, you're probably used to this as a concept. If you just say, I wanna find this data with something in it, Dynamo will go, okay, cool, and it will read out all your million records in your database, and you'll get a bill and a call from your accountant. Um, Quantum Ledger is similar. Um, if you do a lookup without an index, it will perform a table scan. It will load all your data and then filter it in memory. Um, that also applies for inequalities. So even if you've got a field index, you can't say, oh, for the field greater than this or less than this or a field containing this string. 
you can only use one index per query. So if you have indexes that are sort of sparse, so we have a status field that's one or zero, and we query with the status field as the first query item, it will probably use that index, and then if you've got a more precise index later on, it will just filter that in memory anyway. So that can trip you up as well with quantum ledger. It doesn't look at the best index to use for a query, it just uses the first index it sees in your query. And you're charged for read I.O. operations, as you are, again, with many AWS services. Um, if you trigger a table scan, A, it will be expensive. Also, it will time out. There's a timeout of 30 seconds on any quantum ledger query. So even if you're using great indexes, if you have tons of data and quantum ledger just can't return it all in time, it will time out. You will still be charged. That's not great. Um, you may have noticed on the console, it tells me the read I.O.s of a query. So if you want to practice your query writing, do it in the console. And it will tell you this used 1,000 read I.O.s. Um, and then you can be like, okay, I need to optimize that query more. How can I do that? Um, but really, the thing here is this is not the place to analyze or query your data. This is a store of your data. This is a place to verify its integrity, to trust the data that's in it. It is not a place to do queries, text search, or anything else. But we have some tools to fix that. We have streams. Quantum Ledger has a native integration with Kinesis, so you can run a Kinesis stream. Every operation on your database um, deletes, inserts, selects will run through your Kinesis stream. So you can then process that and do something like put it into Dynamo or a SQL database or um, OpenSearch or somewhere else. We also have S3 exports. You can open the journal. Um, you can put it as a backup. You can do it on a regular basis. You can do it one time just to test it, to download it to your computer. You can use it for verification as well. And so with these different tools, we're able to uh, you work around some of those limitations in Quantum Ledger um, and get our data out in the format we need it. And Quantum Ledger plays really well with other AWS services. We use Dynamo for caching derived data, so like a user's running account balance. Um, Aurora Serverless is really handy. You can just pipe all your data into Aurora Serverless, and then when you need to do a big query on it, it scales up. And Lambda is great for interacting with streams uh, and also API Gateway for working on driver limitations. Uh, our business uses primarily PHP. There is no driver for PHP, so we built a TypeScript API uh, that we can send requests to from PHP so we can use Quantum Ledger. And that's a really good workaround. And you can also start applying extra validation rules at your API edge, so it's even better for that. So we began this talk suggesting maybe no one wants to use a new database. Um, and hopefully I've convinced some of you otherwise. Thank you very much. Mike said no questions, so it's time for lunch, right? <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you back in an hour. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You find me around if you want to ask questions.